interpretation. What a strange way to talk about music, as if it's a translation from a language to another, when music is supposed to be that universal language, <clears throat> and the notation is supposed to give all the answers. Well, it doesn't. And that's why I still think we're useful as piano teachers, <coughs> before some app will replace us after artificial intelligence overtakes the world fully. And there will still be room for in between the notes. <sighs> Just like between the words. Oh, I know accuracy is essential. I believe very much in it. And we need to be very strict. Oh. You know, what do a teacher do? Stare at the score together with the student, giving the lesson. What do you do? Detect, organize, manage the statement of the music. Oh, it's a second guessing. It's like most students, all the notes have to be there. Fine, the rhythm, the notes, the pedal, the phrasing, the articulation. <coughs> Sorry. But that doesn't suffice. So it's not the recitation that matters. No matter how authentically accurate we need to be, reliable when nervous, but reliable through technique, muscular memory. But about the strategy of the interpretation, who chooses, how you choose the tempo, the phrasing, the pacing, Ah, oh, that's why I think an interpretation in music, it's really a narration rather than a recitation. Or rather, to a certain extent with the tradition of the 19th century, where interpretation and improvisation at given spots of the piece, either punctuations, cadential, either endings, was the expected signature of a giving virtuoso. That was also because in those days, the authenticity mattered less than the individual statement of the piece through a given performer. Of course, that led to exaggerations in the points of most, let's say, paraphrases or improvised um, notations or notations that represent, you know, this pianist played an octave lower or this pianist added this arpeggio or even this pianist added a cadenza. And then you get to Busoni list, of course, before and all the great performers who in fact, because they were composers were expected like, possibly Chopin as well, and um, Mozart before, and so on, to play their music. You know, they were not expected to play somebody else's music. Therefore, nobody was suspecting that Chopin, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, when playing their own music, are not doing the interpretation of their music, since it was embedded in their creativity. And the notation was mostly also for transmission, for rehearsal, Rehearsing with students, rehearsing with orchestra members. Then, of course, the notation had to become accurate, precise, reliable, not just notated improvisation like Mozart Concerti, where he filled up then everything that he didn't complete because he played it mostly, let's say, half-baked, while it sounded fully baked. And then for the publisher, just like Chopin ballads or other composers who complete the statement. So for others to play, 
I assume if it was possible to have had a recording available after the improvised performance of a Mozart concerto by himself or Chopin ballad in a salon by himself, nobody would need a, a score since people wanted just to hear it. But of course the salons were the exchange of um, awarenesses about who can afford which artists' works, paintings, sculptures, music, and therefore the publisher needed to publish because most of the high-level society bourgeoisie in France had daughters playing piano, and therefore they had to publish them. To, to a certain extent, those publishing of that time were just mostly normalized, not to be too eccentric according to perhaps the original flow of the improvisation by the composers. It's granted a speculation. Who's to know exactly, right? But it's, it's, it's incredible to imagine that in that, let's say, end of 19th century, there was no separation between interpretation and performance in terms of creative restatement. Hey, when you do the transcription, like, listed of um, operas by Wagner, who he was promoting as he was his son-in-law for his um, opera house um, to be built in Bayreuth as a fundraiser, or other operas, Rigoletto and others. It was a genre. It's almost like a medley today or some kind of a teaser for a film. So you get the best from an aria, from a famous opera, and you make a theme and variations, or you make a fantasy out of it, or you make an improvised um, piece, which then becomes notated. And once it's notated, by essence, it cannot be improvised. It's set in stone. And now, fast forward to 2021, almost 2022, there's very little room for that allowed between audition, competitions, positions, um, expectations. There is a normalization through publishing, through um, generations of Henley uh, or texting or uh, other of these uh, like Baron writers and publishers who emphasize the authenticity by the concept of our text, regardless if there was one that uh, arrived to us, or that there were many, perhaps copies of students, or performers, or like Chopin three times, sending it to German, English, and French publisher at the same time, but of course copying it by hand. Discrepancies happen, willing or unwilling, and perhaps there was improvements in a way. Or perhaps the details didn't matter that much. Uh, of course, if they all had photocopy machines and computers with uh, engraving software, Bach's children would have been so happy to play um, games, meaning not spending their week mostly copying their father's um, weekly cantata. And uh, Chopin would not, uh, not felt so bad as to um, composing, but then writing to a friend that he cannot stand spending so much time copying the pieces. It's time consuming. And in fact, the creativity is so different for each composer. For us to imagine how this music was spawned in the mind heart and soul of these people is difficult to imagine. In fact, it's probably not possible because we don't have that scope. It's common to say that Mozart was told when asked, um, was telling, when asked, when do you write your sketches? And he says, I sketch in my mind. Beethoven sketched on paper and we have proofs. So they have different ways. It's like concentration, it's like attention, it's like memorization. The ear, the eye, the hand, 
to perform, to compose, or to write, or to improvise, or to transcribe the imagination, and of course, the desire to play the piece at its best, except it never comes out twice the same because of the instrument or because of the mood, because of the personal situation of the performer. So there are variables. I really believe that this is the most interesting part is the variables. And that gives the opportunity for a student to discover something an approach, a direction that the teacher haven't seen or perhaps heard. And I don't exclude the fact that we all search at all ages with some of the pieces that are part of our lifetime partnership, you know, the Chopin Ballade, the Liszt Sonata, the Brahms Intermezzi, the Bach Partitas, the Beethoven Appassionatas, and then the lesser, you know, played music like Albanese, uh, Iberia, but still very important. And of course, even lesser like Gabriel Dupont compared to Debussy or Faure, who is still a respected name, but not as household as Ravel. And um, regardless, there is no hierarchy here, but nevertheless, the more we advance, the more we record, the more we publish, the more we have um, comparisons to draw from for how to play it compared to if it's music that has been less already set in stone, so to say, in terms of interpretational choices. So when students are um, given a piece and they compare how different people play, they realize that it means so many different things to so many different people, even if it's the same authentic score or at least closest to what we expect it to be authentic. So the place of the teacher is very, 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 very tricky. A student loves to admire a performer, but the performer don't always teach. What is teach? Explain what you do by hint, by perhaps you do it as a performer without even to verbalize it to yourself. You just think it and you evolve with it and you organize it. A conductor explains or demonstrates things to the orchestra. The pianist practicing alone develops, digs, and uh, rises at some point, at some level of awareness that you know, this corresponds to what I want to do in the piece. And it's still evolving. And so therefore it seems to me like ultimately the piano performance is an incredible moment of um, ephemeral, and at the same time, very appealingly disappearing um, sandcastle on the beach. And all of a sudden, every time you replay the piece and you have already established a plan, you have practiced the details, you organized yourself, it doesn't come out the way you planned it. And that's beautiful, but discouraging and almost disturbing for hard practicing students who still hope, I think wrongly, to reassure themselves in order to produce the famous all the notes clean performance uh, obstacle course concept that they have to play in performance as well as the, the practicing. But that's not possible. The listening quality is not the same. The attention quality is not the same. Practicing, you can stop and start, do exercises, introduce inside um, excerpts, do loops, and um, at some point you can perhaps go through the piece, but when you go through the piece, as it's written, well, with or without repeats, that's another story, but even so, the piece starts living its own life and dictates you what it wishes. And you have to keep concentration, attention for the details always ahead. And then deal with the unexpected because it doesn't come out the way you planned it. The acoustics, the instrument, always different for pianists. And then you have to still be so accurate to the, you know, milligram detail of piano touch for voicing, articulation. And this kind of um, awareness brings pianists to separate the technical approach from the musical approach, 
when in fact the one leads to the other and um, they should work hand in hand to the point to which the good practice is the one that allows you to deal with the unexpected when it happens on stage or during an audition or when you're nervous. So yes, it doesn't come out like you planned, but it comes out with a certain coherence, even if it's this ephemeral coherence on the moment, on the spur of the moment. I know it's disconcerting to say, but I think that's the best way to prepare for that kind of moment where the psychological awareness of the piece is different. How the piece reveals itself. And I think that once you accept that, then you deal with it better. The breathing of the rests is not just metronomic. It could be psychological, physiological. You breathe like, ah, oh, you exhale, and then you do another sentence. Of course, you can consider that the overindulging rubato, but I think it also gives the true narrative quality of the interpretation. I know it's already very difficult to play all the notes correctly, precisely, reliably. That's why technique is so important. Muscular memory, speed of brain, eye, to fingers, and then memory, either from the eye and the ear, or, of course, an awareness of the musical grammar through which you go in terms of modulations and elements where you know where you're in the piece in real time, in GPS, so to say. And let's say the unwishful happens, God forbids, the memory slip. What is next? I know it and all of a sudden my brain freezes because I'm too nervous or I'm not in it and my concentration is not with me. I'm distracted by the, I don't know, the, the power of the event or by the just distraction. And the autopilot works, but not that long. And then you watch your fingers play until they crash. Just like a computer freeze, right? And uh, that's when the awareness of where you're in the piece formally and uh, in terms of grammar, tonality, and cadential points of view, you can always find a way to more or less controlled um, go back to where you remember you can and then find your way through when you're less nervous. Okay, it's like looping. It's not perfect, but it's better than stopping. If it's only finger memory, that's hard. I wish there was an, in, an universal panacea and I would find it to help the students. But I still think that um, the real-time awareness going through the piece, even repetitively, because repetitively, you have to remain focused and concentrated on the piece as well as on the industry of playing it. If the industry of playing it overtakes the importance of the playing it, then it's like headless chicken. Conductors don't play. Orchestras play. Conductors anticipate. Orchestras play what is on the beat. So your pianist conductor has to anticipate and your pianist orchestra have to execute on the beat. And then you have to allow a little bit of rubato knowing that you always can re-merge in the traffic of the tempo. In other words, it's not a MIDI interpretation through recitation of the texts. We are not computers. We are humans. We retell the story. Even if accurate, we still have in between the notes the space to delay a nano moment, a note to minute. Like you say, oh, I would like to tell you. 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 Well, I would like to tell you thank you. <laughs>